So, first lesson uh, for today is about gram negative coxide. So, we will oh, there are several um, examples of gram negative coxide, but we will just be concentrating on Okay, so like what I said, there are many gram negative coxide, but for today's discussion, we will only be um, focusing on one family, and that would be the Neisseria C. So the general characteristic of the family is that they are plump coxide. When you say plump coxide, it means that unlike Staphylococcus, which is perfect sphere, plant coxide are actually coxide but like a plant person, it's more than a father side. So sometimes um, uh, you would you would actually, uh, the best way to describe, let's say for example, the members that they are coffee bean shape, so or kidney shape or coffee bean shape. So this is how they describe them, okay? So some of them are coco bacilli. So when you say, if this is a coxi, this would be the bacilli. A coco bacilli would be something in between a coxi and a bacilli. Okay. So, of course, they are gram-negative. Um, they are non-motile. And some of them are strictly aerobic. So they would really need oxygen for growth. And the optimum temperature is between... 32 to 36 degrees centigrade. So, if you notice, this temperature is a characteristic of a mesophile. So, that's the reason why most of the time, they would purely infect, they would purely infect humans, particularly the Neisseria gonorrhea. Okay. Nevertheless, there are several genera. There are several genera under the family Neisseria C. This includes Neisseria, Kingella, Aikinella, and Simoncella. Okay, but um, for today's meeting, we will only be concentrating on two important species of Neisseria, and these are Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitidis, the gonococci and the meningo coxi. So, general characteristic of Neisseria, they are coxi, except for one species, that would be Neisseria wiberi. Neisseria wiberi is one species of Neisseria that is not a coxi, but it is a bacilli. Okay, so there are catalase positive oxidase positive okay and of course whenever there are there are cell divisions um, they would the progeny would always be in two planes so that's the reason why um, the best way to describe them would be they are gram negative diplococci so they are gram negative diplococci so aside from the human pathogens we also have the non-pathogens. This includes the species of Cinerea, Elongata. So, this is the non-pathogen that is Bacillus. The pathogen that is Bacillus is Viberi. And then, Flavicens, Lactamica, Mucosa, Polysaccharia, Sika, and Subflava. The rest of the family of Neisseria C are Bacilli. Such as the Kingella, Aikinella and Simoncella. These are considered as bacilli. Noteworthy to mention is Simoncella because of the characteristic of gliding motility. Not all organisms are actually capable of doing the gliding motility. Okay, on that note, um, let us discuss first the, grand, the general characteristic of Neisseria. So they are aerobic. Aerobic gram negative diplococci. Okay. So, if we're going to enlarge this picture, can you see this red thing here? 
These are PMNs. These are neutrophil. Okay? These are neutrophil. And then, if we're going to enlarge this, it will appear like this. Gram-negative diplococci. Diplo means they are arranged by pairs. And they are kidney shape or bean shape. Some of them are intracellular. So when I say intracellular, let's say for example, this would be the PMNs. Some of them are located intracellularly, indicating the fact that the neutrophils had actually engulfed them. Okay, so some of them are extracellular, some of them are intracellular. Okay, so Neisseria elongata and wibbery, or weaver, th these are exemptions of catalase negative rod shape for elongata. Neisseria weaver is catalase positive rod shape. Okay, so the organism um, exists as usual flora of the upper respiratory tract. Okay? In, okay, and urogenital tract. Meaning, most isolates are non-pathogenic and are considered as routine, normal flora. Except for Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitis. Meaning, if Neisseria gonorrhea is is isolated from your urogenital tract, you cannot claim, oh, it's normal to have Neisseria gonorrhea in the urogenital tract. Of course, that's not normal. Okay. Now, except for an another another exception would be Neisseria meningitis. Do you know that? Okay. Neisseria meningitis, though they are pathogenic, but for some of us, some of us could serve as carriers. Because for some of us, we could um, Neisseria meningitis could be considered as commensals, meaning they live in our as upper respiratory tract without causing any harm or infections. Okay, that's the reason why during outbreaks of meningococcinia, it's very important that you boost up your immune system. Okay, the victims of meningococcinia are those those who have weak immune system. Okay, um, going back to the going back to the picture, you could actually see here the intracellular the intracellular organism. Okay, so you can actually see the you can actually see the intracellular bacteria. So when you say intracellular bacteria, it means that they are located intracellularly. So this is an example of ah. Let me go back. Yeah. Ah. It's the matter. This is the example of intracellular organism. So, as you can see in the picture, the organism, these are Neisseria gonorrhea. Um, this is actually isolated from the pus, pus discharge. So, later on, we'll be discussing how do you think these pus are actually um, being collected and why do you think people with gonorrhea would have pus and why is it called gonorrhea? What's the origin of the word gonorrhea? Okay, as you can see, Two primary human pathogens include Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitis. So they are true, they are primary pathogens. You won't see any monkey having gonorrhea. Okay, you won't see any monkey having meningitis or meningococcinia. Because these are true primary human pathogens. Okay, so there are, there are, these two species are also encapsulated. Okay, so they are encapsulated and they are pathogenic for humans. So this is another picture, another picture of the organism that are intracellular. So if you can see, this is the membrane of the WBC or the neutrophil. 
you'll be able to see the gonococcide. Okay, the gonococcide inside the neutrophil. By the way, gonococcide is the common name of Neisseria gonorrhea. Okay, so what makes, uh, what contributes to the antigenicity of Neisseria gonorrhea? Okay, so as of the moment, there hasn't been any proven effective vaccine. Okay, but if you remember our discussions on the parts of the bacterial cell, pili, okay, which serves as an important um, uh, appendage for, for conjugation, would be the main target of potential vaccine. Okay, so pili would usually be the main target of potential vaccine. So particularly, the proteins against the pili. So the, pro the, the protein found in the pili, we call it the pilin. Okay. So for Neisseria meningitis, okay, the organism would produce a capsule. Okay. And the, the type of the capsule is the basis for having the zero group or zero types. So we have the following zero groups in humans. This includes group A, B, C, X, Y, Z, and W135. Okay. Luckily for humans, um, an effective vaccine has already been developed for Neisseria meningitis. The vaccine is actually developed that would target on the capsule, particularly for zero group A, C, Y, and W135. So, if you have been vaccinated against ACY W135, what will happen is that your immune system will produce antibodies and these antibodies will target on the capsule of the Neisseria. It, you'll not have ni ni Neisseria meningitis in the future, okay, provided that the one that has infected you are those zero groups that would have the following capsule. So the capsule A, C, Y, and W135. Okay, so having said that, uh, we could actually conclude that the main virulence factor of Neisseria would be the pili. And why is it important for the organisms? Um, different diplococci tend to communicate with one another by means of pili. Because pili would be important for conjugation. The genes that encode for virulence factor could be transmitted to another group of organism by means of the pili. Now there are five types of or five distinct colony types. The most virulent type of pili are T1 and okay, T3, T4, and T5 colonies doesn't have uh, do not have pili. Okay? Aside from that, the pili will also allow them or would also aid in the attachment to host tissues. They will, it will also help prevent phagocytosis. And most importantly, it will aid them in exchange of genetic material from cell to cell, particularly if we're talking about the sex pili. So DNA, genetic materials from this cell could be transferred to another cell by means of pili. So that's how they exchange genes and other virulence factors. Okay. So the antigenic variation, okay, T1 and T2, okay, and, uh, would be the most virulent. Why? Because T3, T4, and T5 uh, would usually lose their pili during subcultivation meaning they are not as virulent. They are not as virulent as the T1 and T2. Pili will also evade our immune system. Okay, aside from pili, capsule would also be a very important factor for Neisseria. We all know for a fact that the capsule will prevent the organisms from being phagocytized. So there won't be any phagocytosis. And another thing is that the cell outer membrane would also be contributing to the antigenicity 
Okay? Um, what will happen is that once we are infected, it will stimulate our immune system to produce antibodies. But these antibodies are said to be useless, meaning these antibodies do not provide protective mechanisms, but this would merely, this would merely uh, um, aid, let's say for example, in the serum diagnosis, but not necessarily, not necessarily for protective mechanism. Okay, so aside from that, um, we also have the outer membrane porin proteins. What is a porin? Porin is actually a pore found at the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. Remember this, only gram-negative bacteria, only gram-negative bacteria would have porins. Okay, so what are the different proteins that could be found in porins? There are actually three groups of proteins that could be found in the membrane protein proteins. These are the pore A and pore B, protein 2, also known as the OPA, and the protein 3. Okay, pore A and pore B would be very important for the bacteria. Well, this protein will prevent them from the effects of complement. You know what a complement is? A complement is our natural defense. We produce complement in response to antigen and antibody complex. And the primary reason why we produce complement is that complement will cause lysis of the bacteria. But because of the presence of pore A and pore B, that could not probably happen. We will not be able to have bacterial lysis because of the presence of pore A and pore B. And that's a bad thing for us. Second, the protein 2. Okay? The protein 2 or the OPA facilitate adherence to phagocytic and epithelial cells. What does it mean? Let's say, for example, this is the protein 2 or the OPA. Okay? If this is the urethra, if this is the urethra, and then this would be the epithelial cells lining in the urethra, okay? What will happen is that Neisseria will be adhering at the epithelial cell lining. And there would be several of them in the urethra. And the one that facilitates their adherence, we all know that would be the fimbriae. But aside from the fimbriae, it is also the OPA that will facilitate the epithelial cell lining. Not only that, they are also capable of producing protein 3. Protein 3 will prevent the action of IgG, meaning our antibodies would become useless because of the presence of protein 3. Okay. They will also produce the lipooligosaccharides, LOS, which will contribute to the tissue damage. And do you know what immunoglobulins would be most predominant in the secretions? That would be our IgA. But, Neisseria can produce the IgA protease. What will happen to the IgA protease? IgA protease, IgA protease will, if this is the IgA, dimer in the secretions, the Neisseria will cleave the IgA. And once it is cleaved, IgA would be useless. And what would be responsible for its cleavage or for its cleaving? Not cleavage. Okay? The IgA protease. Okay. And then, of course, um, the fimbriae. Fimbriae will allow attachment. So, this is the actual scenario. Um, that this is the reason why you have too many epithelial cells, uh, too many neutrophils. 
If this is your epithelial lining, this is your epithelial lining. You have epithelial cells here in the urethra. So what will happen is that you'll be infected with gonorrhea. So you'll have gonorrhea here. And having an infection will attract what WBC? It will attract Yes, it will attract neutrophil. Neutrophil will try to engulf the bacteria, but neutrophil will be overwhelmed. So that's why there will be too many neutrophil in the urethra. Urethra is where your urine is supposed to flow. But since there are too many pass, there are too many pass, so if you're going to urinate, your urine will be black. Okay? And would have to go through the neutrophil and by the time it goes out of the penis drop and it will be painful and the reason why you cannot just remove them away out of the epithelial cells because of the fibrase fibrase allows adherence okay so aside from that, they would also produce endotoxin. Endotoxin would be coming from the lipopolysaccharides and then the outer membrane proteins, the three proteins that I've mentioned to you, the pore A and B, protein 2 and 3, they are also important for adhesion. And of course, the IgA protease. And this is what will happen. Um, humans are the only humans are the only natural host of gonorrhea gonorrhea means flow of seed so gonorrhea is flow of seed or flow of semen because they thought once you are infected with Gonorrhea in the in the olden days they thought that semen will be painfully discharged, but it's not really a semen, but these are pus. Pus is made up of dead WBC. It is not only the urogenital tract that will be uh, infected. Okay, if you have if you have gonorrhea. It depends on the sexual activity of the person. So, urogenital tract, pharynx, anal canal. Pharynx if the person is involved in oral sex, or anal canal if the person was involved in unprotective anal sex or sodomy. Okay. So, the eye could also be infected. If you notice in the illustration, this child okay, has gonorrhea in the eye, so we call it ophthalmia neonatorum. Ophthalmia neonatorum okay, happens when the child is born from a mother. It is infected with gonorrhea because the birth canal okay is infected with the organism ophthalmoneotorum could be prevented using creds prophylaxis if you still remember our discussion in microbial control creds prophylaxis is made up of one percent silver nitrate but nowadays you have many options aside from creds prophylaxis you can simply apply antibiotic eye ointment in the eye whether the child is born from an infected mother or not can actually apply so it depends on the promiscuity of the person so if the person is involved in anal sex so the anal canal could be infected or or 
the pharynx could also be look at the pharynx. So this is an example of a pharynx with gonorrhea. Yeah. So humans are the only known host of Neisseria gonorrhea. So as you can as what I've told you a while ago, they are coffee bean shaped, kidney shaped, they are arranged in pairs or otherwise known as diplococci. They could be found intracellularly inside the neutrophil. They are fastidious and they are capnophilic, meaning to say they require CO2 or carbon dioxide for growth. And of course, um, it is an acute pyogenic infection. So when you say pyogenic, it is a term that means they are pass forming, capable of pass production. Okay? Um, they could infect the columnar and transitional epithelium of the urethra and the cervix, which means even women could be infected. But most of the time, women are asymptomatic. And they could infect the anal canal, the pharynx, the conjunctiva. Incubation period would only be about two to seven days and the newborn infection is called ophthalmia neonatorum. So the disease in male would have about one to seven days incubation period transmitted only by intimate sexual contact. Meaning, um, having sexual intercourse without any protective mechanism such as condom uh, will at, will uh, actually predispose the person to have gonorrhea and 95% of males will show symptoms of acute infection. 95%. Okay. So, what would be the symptoms? Difficulty in urination, dysuria, and there would be urethral discharge. Okay. However, the complications would be actually much severe. So, epididymitis is the inflammation of the coiled tube of the testicle. That could possibly happen. Urethral stricture is the narrowing of the urethra. This is the reason why there would be burning sensation whenever the male urinates because of the urethral stricture. Prostatitis is the inflammation of the prostate glands. So these are the possible complications of gonorrhea in males. For females, um, 20 to 80 percent of females are said to be asymptomatic. Meaning, you are already infected with gonorrhea but you, you don't show any signs and symptoms. That's actually very dangerous because a woman would think that she is not infected and would and and if you're not if you think that you're not infected you won't have any medical intervention so you keep going going until you infect many men okay so the symptoms if ever the women became symptomatic would include burning or increased frequency of urination then vaginal discharge abdominal pain, vaginal bleeding, fever. Okay, do you know that gonorrhea can cause the so-called PID, also known as the pelvic inflammatory disease? It's actually much complicated for women because as a result, PID would, would have, uh, women would have sterility, meaning she can no longer bear child. Okay, or if ever she could, it would be a difficult pregnancy. Okay, there would be an ectopic pregnancy and the so-called perihepatitis or the Fitzhugh-Curtis syndrome. Okay, so the Fitzhugh-Curtis syndrome. Disseminated means that the organisms have been spread in different parts of the body. So the acute forms include fever, chills, intermittent bacteremia, and skin lesions if untreated. 
Okay? This will progress to septic joint okay, of the disease. So, gonococcal arthritis gonococcal arthritis uh, would result in two disseminated gonococcal bacteremia and disseminated gonococcal bacteremia means that the organisms have already have already reached the joints. So, meaning from the reproductive system, from the reproductive system, the organisms have reached the joints. Imagine. So, but before it could happen, uh, uh, bacteremia should start first. Meaning, from urogenital tract, they would go to the blood, and from the blood, the organisms will go now to the joint. Now you have the so-called gonococcal arthritis, which is very rare. So, it happens when you do not treat the acute symptoms. Okay. In children, we call it ophthalmia neonatorum. So, it occurs during vaginal delivery, meaning it's actually safer if a, if a mother has gonorrhea, it's actually safer to, to have cesarean section because the child will not have to pass through the birth canal. Even if you have cred prophylaxis, if you know that that woman has gonorrhea, you won't risk, right? You'll take a risk of passing the child through the infected birth canal. So, in summary, okay, in summary, complications in male would, acute, uh, would include acute urethritis, purulent discharge, 95% of males would be symptomatic, and some strains are are capable of causing that infection, particularly the AHU strains with arginine, hypocentine, and uracil, prostatitis, and epididymitis. For female, mostly are asymptomatic, 20 to 80 percent. They have, uh, they could develop pelvic inflammatory disease, which could result into ectopic pregnancy, sterility, perihepatitis, and the so-called Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome. Okay, how do we collect specimen? For a male, we collect from the urethra. From female, we collect from the endocervix. This is for the male. Do you see? Two to three centimeter deep rotate the specimen. And then for anal canal, it's about four to five centimeter deep. Okay. So, do you know that you're not supposed to use cotton because cotton has calcium alginate and it's inhibitory. So, instead of using cotton, we're supposed to use the Dacron or rayon swab. So, instead of using cotton, we're supposed to use the Dacron or rayon swab. Okay, if you are to transport the specimen in a distant laboratory, you have to place, to maintain the viability of the specimen, you have to place them in, in a transport medium. So, what are the transport medium? So, this is an example of a transport medium. So, examples are Amy's medium with charcoal or the Jembeck, which stands for Jonathan E. Martin Biological Environmental Chamber the transgrow medium, the bio bag, and then the gonopak. So this will, uh, the transport medium will will actually uh, preserve the viability of the specimen. Okay. So for the genital sites, normal handling. Okay, if the male's dot doesn't have any discharge. You have to rotate the specimen 2 to 3 cm deep. Anal, oral, pharyngeal, eye, blood joints, okay, uh, which could also be collected. But if you're trying to isolate Neisseria from the blood, you must tell the laboratory, the doctors must tell the laboratory that you're trying to isolate Neisseria. That's why in the request form, at the lowermost portion of the request form, 
there's what you call TC. It means to consider. My theory, yeah. So that the laboratory will use the appropriate culture medium for the isolation of Neisseria. Okay, so what are the appropriate culture medium? Um, there's a specific, there's a specific um, culture medium, the Transgrow Gem Bank, which I've already did mention. And there's also a special um, about this transport medium because it's a special media placed in a capnophilic atmosphere meaning that atmosphere would have carbon dioxide or CO2, okay? But you have to plate, okay, the specimen within six hours to maintain um, the viability. Okay, you're supposed to use cho chocolate agar. Okay, so what is chocolate agar? Do you know the difference between a chocolate agar and a blood agar? Okay, very good. Naisip ko na yung sagot niya. Chocolate agar is actually a heated blood. Blood agar plate blood agar plate is unheated blood. Okay? If you're going to heat blood, so how do you prepare blood agar plate? You have a blood agar base, blood agar base, and then you get the blood agar base out of the autoclave you allow the blood agar base to cool. When it's for about 45 degrees centigrade, you, about, you add 5 to 10% sheep's blood, then it becomes blood agar plate. But if you want to add, if you want to convert that to chocolate agar plate, so right, right after you got the blood agar base out of the autoclave, you add 5 to 10% sheep's blood while the blood agar base is hot and it will turn brown, hence chocolate agar plate. There's no Hershey's Cadbury's in chocolate agar plate. Okay, you might think, ah, oh, sir, ano pong ilalagay namin sa chocolate agar plate? Ferrero lang po kami meron eh. Wow, Ferrero, right? Okay, so, you cannot, you cannot add that. Okay, so the reason why we call it, the reason why we call it uh, chocolate agar plates because of because of the heated blood. You say heated blood, not not uncooked blood. Not cooked and uncooked blood. Because if it's cooked blood, then it's dinuguan. Okay, so we just say heated or unheated blood. Okay? But what's, what's the purpose? What's the rationale why we heat why we heat um, blood in chocolate agar plate? If we heat blood, we are actually destroying the so-called the so-called labile factors. Okay, labile factors or the heat labile factors are those things that are being removed whenever blood is being heated, such as in case of chocolate agar plate. Okay, but wait, there's more. It's not just an ordinary chocolate agar plate for Nigeria. This chocolate agar plate becomes selective because of the addition of, of inhibitory agents. Most of these inhibitory agents are antibiotics that could prevent the growth of unwanted gram-positive bacteria, unwanted gram-negative bacteria, and unwanted fungi. Okay? It will prevent overgrowth of the normal flora. So, when we incubate the organisms as much as possible, we use about 35% carbon dioxide to the use of candle jar, and then you can actually use the modified Tyre Martin agar. What makes it modified? Okay, it is actually a chocolate agar plate wherein you have added antibiotics, hence the so called modified Tyre Martin agar. In modified tire martin agar, look at the colonies of the bacteria. They are small, gray, translucent, and raised. This is the characteristics of Neisseria gonorrhea. Small, gray, translucent, and raised. Okay, so this is another example of, of chocolate agar plate with candle, with candle or inside the candle jar. 
Okay. So, most of the time, uh, most of the time, we're using trimetoprene. In modified, um, Tyre Martin Agar uses BCM as antibiotics. Um, B stands for vancomycin, C stands for colistin, N stands for nistatin. Vancomycin prevents the growth of gram-positive bacteria. Colistin prevents the growth of gram-negative bacteria. Nistatin prevents the growth of fungi. Okay. And the modified tire Martin agar uses trimetoprim as inhibitory substances. So, this makes the medium selective. Selective medium. So, the medium becomes selective once you have added antibiotics okay, in the medium. Okay. We can also do the direct microscopic examination. Um, in direct microscopic examination, we collect the urethral discharge and then we gram stain the urethral discharge. What do you expect to see in the gram stain? It expected that you'll be able to see PMNs, some of these gram-negative diplococci could be intracellular. Some of them could be extracellular. If you collect it from male, then it is it is actually almost diagnostics for gonorrhea. In fact, in actual practice, if you become positive with gram-negative diplococci with pus coming from the urethral discharge, some doctors will not advise you to submit specimen for culture, they will give you antibiotics right away. But some doctors will prefer to have culture and sensitivity. Okay. Then for women, it's about uh, 50 to 70 percent. It is less diagnostic. Why? Because of the fact that they are asymptomatic, some diplococci would actually mimic the normal vaginal flora. So, meaning, some women would have gram-negative diplococci also as part of that of their vaginal flora. But that gram-negative diplococci is not really Neisseria, but other bacteria, which you cannot tell by simply looking at the gram stain. For male, it becomes diagnostic. Why? Because male cannot claim, oh, I'm sorry, that's my vaginal flora. <laughs> so male cannot tell that. But for female, at least, Female could tell the doctor, oh, I think that's my vaginal flora. And the doctor, okay, let's have a culture. But for male, once gram-negative diplococci has been isolated from your urethral discharge, so hashtag alam na this. So the doctor will give you antibiotics. Okay. So we could also verify bacteria, whether it's gram-negative diplococci by penicillin distance. We know for a fact that um, in penicillin this test, the organism will not have uh, will not have um, a zone of inhibition since they are gram negative. Okay, now look at the selective medium for tire Martin. This is what I told you: VCN, vancomycin, colistin, and mistatin. But for the modified tire Martin, it's VCN, but you have added what? Trimetoprim. The reason why you have added trimetoprim because trimetoprim will prevent the swarming of the proteins. Another one would be the Martin Lewis medium. It's also vancomycin colistin, but instead of using nistatin, you'll be using anisomycin plus trimetoprim also. Your city medium will also use vancomycin and colistin and trimetoprim, but instead of using mistatin, you're using amphotericin B, which is actually more expensive. And the G-select, okay, gonococcylec, you're using vancomycin, lincomycin. You have two antibiotics that will fight gram-positive bacteria. 
And then you have Colistina again, Rams Negative, Amphotaris in the against Fungi, and Trimetoprim. Okay. That will prevent the swarming. Why do we want to prevent the growth of yeast? Again, some women might have yeast from the specimen. And you do not want yeast to interfere with the result because yeast would also look like uh, would would also be round, so that could be mistaken as oxide by inexperienced microscopists. Okay, so to be sure, we have to use this selective medium. Okay, I, I stand corrected. Um, penicillin this test, there would usually be zone of inhibition if it's gram-negative diplococci. So, this is the microscopic appearance of the organism. Okay, so diplococci because they are in pairs, such as this one. This is letter C, this is Kingella. And letter D, this is Acinetobacter. Okay, oxid uh, let's talk about the biochemical test. The screening test for the presence of Neisseria is what you call oxidase test. All you have to do is to get filter paper. You add colonies of filter paper and then you add oxidase reagent. Okay? Initially, the result is pink, but eventually it will turn black. Okay? Meaning, the organisms are dead already because they have reacted to oxidase reagent, which, by the way, is made up of 1% dimethyl paraphenylene di I mean, di dihydrochloride. And the other one, the other possible composition of the oxidase reagent is tetramethyl paraphenylene di I mean, dihydrochloride. So these are the compositions of the oxidase reagent, which is very much easier to remember. And then, Carbohydrate utilization agar is another uh, biochemical test to identify the presence of Neisseria species. In carbohydrate utilization test, you'll be using the CTA agar. CTA agar stands for cysteine triptychase agar. Again, if you remember lesson on mannitol agar, we utilize phenol red as an indicator, right? So remember. Whenever there is fermentation, one of the product is acid. And if the medium is acid, if it's phenol red, it will turn yellow. Therefore, in carbohydrate fermentation test, a positive reaction is yellow, a negative reaction is red or pink. Okay. Okay. So, what you could, um, aside from that, you can also use the rapid test which will give you result two to four hours after the pure culture so what type of carbohydrates are we supposed to use um, there are many options but our concern for our concern would be what uh, glucose and maltose why why glucose and maltose glucose and maltose um, there are also lactose, there would also be sucrose, but our concern would be glucose and maltose. For Neisseria gonorrhea, only glucose will be positive. For Neisseria meningitis, glucose and maltose would be positive. But since we're talking about Neisseria gonorrhea in carbohydrate utilization test, only glucose would be, only glucose would be fermented okay now these are the selected culture based methods for the identification of Neisseria okay look conventional method what is the conventional method if it's a conventional method we're actually using the CTA agar Okay, yellow is the positive reaction, yellow is the positive reaction, and then pink or red would be the negative reaction. Okay, 
There would also be what you call the chromogenic substrate. The principle of chromogenic substrate is enzyme production. Okay? Enzyme production. Um, the production of enzyme would result into change in color. Okay? And then, we also have coagglutination. Coagglutination test. Here, you'll be using monoclonal antibodies to detect if you have already developed antibodies against Neisseria gonorrhea. And then, of course, you have the modified conventional, um, the BBL crystal ID. So, the BBL crystal ID um, is actually, you have, a, you have a well, all you have to do is to add the culture and there, there will be change in color. It's actually less, more expensive than the CTA, but it's actually less dangerous to perform. And then, of course, um, the, that would, aside from BBL, that would also the Carbofirm, um, Rapid NH, Microscan. In the hospital, the most popular ones are the API and the BBL Crystal ID. So, this is the Rapid Biochemical Test. So, most of these are expensive. So, we're not using this in the laboratory, but in the hospital, you will be encountering these test kits. Okay? And then we also have the FA monoclonal antibody. So this will allow us to give definitive identification. But of course, the most um, accurate, okay, up to the molecular level, would be nucleic acid hybridization, non-amplified. And the other one is the nucleic acid amplification test. What's the difference? Here, you only detect the DNA. Okay, you detect the DNA if it's nucleic acid hybridization non-amplified. You detect you detect the DNA, but you do not amplify the DNA. So, the principle would mainly involve chemiluminescent method. You detect the presence of the DNA. Here, you amplify the DNA. You amplify the DNA using PCR, polymerase chain reaction. So, nucleic acid hybridization, non-amplified, and then the other one would be nucleic acid amplification test. Okay. So, this would be the more specific, the most accurate method. However, these two are very expensive and usually being done only for research purposes. I mean, for ordinary prostitute, a, a, a prostitute who would, would regularly have um, cervical uh, urogenital discharge check she cannot she cannot she or he cannot afford to have PCR oh I'll have my I'll have urethral discharge could you please PCR could you please amplify the DNA of the Niger gonorrhea if it ever is positive so that I'll know what gene would be the most prominent <laughs> no one would say that right so most of the time they will just they will just um, go to the laboratory and have the pure lead discharge, gram stain, and that's it. Gram stain. It's even better rare to have them cultured. More so to have or detect genes up to the molecular level. So, what's the problem in carbohydrate utilization test? Um, sometimes there could be false negative. False negative because of the weak acid production from glucose and then misidentification of Neisseria subflava and Neisseria meningitidis and then there's another Neisseria that will give positive glucose reaction Cinerea so you cannot really be con you cannot really be a confirmatory if it's if it's just carbohydrate utilization test 
And this will allow us to differentiate, okay, Nigeria, Moraxella, and Kingella. So, I want you to concentrate on these two, Nigeria gonorrhea and Nigeria meningitis. And furthermore, I want you to concentrate, this is the most common distinction between the two, acid production for Neisseria meningitis, positive for glucose and maltose. For Neisseria gonorrhea, glucose. So for you not to forget, just remember, gonorrhea, G. G for glucose only. Neisseria meningitis, meningitis M, meaning with maltose also. Diba? So you'll not forget, Neisseria gonorrhea, G, glucose only. Nigeria meningitis with maltose also. Kasi aside from glucose, it will also be positive for maltose. Okay. And then, um, it says here, if you're just using nutrient agar at 35 degrees centigrade without CO2, both of these would be negative. That's why you have to use modified fire Martin medium, Martin Lewis medium, New York City medium. You have to know the antibiotics that are being added in this culture medium. Not to know the antibiotics that are being added in this culture medium. Okay? So, moving on, um, this will also allow you to differentiate other tests such as the nitrate reduction test. Only Neisseria mucosa would be positive. The rest would be negative. Um, the immunologic assay, I think this includes the coagglutination. The, um, wherein you're using uh, monoclonal antibodies. Uh, here in coagglutination, what, what is actually interesting here is that in coagglutination, you are using S or U's as indicator organism. But this is not just an ordinary S or U's. This S or U's would have um, antibodies that are attached. Ah, this, this would be the S or use, yung green. And the antibodies are attached with S to S or use. These antibodies are what? Antibodies against Neisseria gonorrhea. Meaning, if you have Neisseria gonorrhea in your specimen, this will allow S or use to, okay, agglutinate. Mag-agglutinate yung S or use. Kasi naka-attach sa S or use antibodies against Neisseria gonorrhea. Okay. So, that's co-agglutination. Dito naman, you have a different antibodies. You have an antibodies uh, against the pore protein. Remember the pore protein from outer membranes? Um, yung antibodies naman na to is a different antibodies. These antibodies have a fluorescent pag. Meaning, if you have Neisseria gonorrhea in your specimen, so the antibodies will attach to the pore protein of Neisseria gonorrhea, and what will happen is that Neisseria gonorrhea, when observed under the fluorescent microscope, will glow in the dark. Meaning, let's say for example, ah, I also have gram-negative diplococci, but it's different. It's actually a different species. If I'm going to add monoclonal antibodies, the monoclonal antibodies will not bind to that bacteria because that bacteria doesn't have pore protein. It will only bind to Neisseria gonorrhea. If it will not bind to other bacteria, when you observe under the microscope, it will not glow in the dark. But if it's Neisseria gonorrhea, because of the presence of pore protein, because of the presence of pore protein, it will it will actually glow in the dark. Okay? Once it has, it, once it glows in the dark, then it means that the one that you got from your patient is indeed Neisseria gonorrhea. So that's the principle of fluorescent antibody testing. Nucleic assay, acid assays would be the advantage, rapid, sensitive, but, but, um, the, there are several disadvantages. 
Um, for example, you cannot use pharyngeal and rectal specimen. A non-amplified probe tests are only sensitive for cervical cultures in females. And another thing, you do not culture the bacteria, right? For example, you swab. You only get the DNA and you amplify the DNA. You're not able to culture it. Since you're not able to culture it, there's no way for you to do sensitivity testing. So, since you didn't do the sensitivity testing, doctors won't be able to know doctors won't be able to know which antibiotics would be more effective. Or you cannot do the susceptibility testing. So that's the disadvantage of using the nucleic acid assays, which could be divided into non-amplified and amplified. Okay? And then, um, the additional method is the superoxal test. This will determine the oxotypes by adding the arginine, hyposanthine, and uracil. The AHU strain is the oxotypes for Neisseria gonorrhea. Nowadays, the problem is that people have been abusing penicillin. Before they go to Red House District, they will drink penicillin. This will make them protective according to them, protected from gonorrhea according to them. Ginawang vaccine ang penicillin. <laughs> diba, inom muna ako ng penicillin bago punta doon. Or, 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 nakainom na ako ng penicillin. Go! Fight! 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 Win! Fight! Oh, yeah. So, it, it's actually a malpractice. And of course, indiscriminate use of antibiotics. That's why, nowadays, Niger Gonorrhea have developed the plasmid-mediated penicillase-producing Niger Gonorrhea wherein the Niger Gonorrhea were able to produce beta-lactamase and this beta-lactamase destroys the beta-lactam rings of penicillin. Some have actually developed the so-called chromosome-mediated penicillin resistance which will alter the penicillin binding proteins and penicillin will not be able to bind to the organisms. So both of these will make the organisms will make the organisms um, resistant to penicillin. <coughs> so, some of them have developed the so-called plasmid-mediated high-level tetracycline resistance, meaning you become resistant to tetracycline. Some of them have developed chromosome-mediated spectinomycin resistance, so you become resistant to spectinomycin, and some of them would develop resistance to fluoroquinolone. This were the fluoroquinolone was detected in early 90s, but as you can see, the plasmid-mediated penicillin resistance was first observed as early as 1976. So as early as 1976, Nicira had become resistant already to penicillin. Usually, okay. what is the usual treatment? Penicillin G, intramuscularly, um, penicillin by mouth with probenicin. If allergic to penicillin, tetracycline by mouth, and spectinomycin intramuscularly. Pero, yung first three bullets are what? Passe treatment. Nakita nyo naman kanina, there has already been resistance against tetracycline, there has already been resistance against spectinomycin. So, ano pa yung natitira? We are now using the third generation antibiotics. Cefriaxone, cefotaxime, cefositine, these are already third generation cephalosporins. If the bacteria have developed resistance to this third generation. Then, um, wag naman sana mangyari, there's a chance that we might resort to the fourth generation, fifth generation, or 100th generation. The problem nowadays, do you know what the problem nowadays? We're developing superbugs. You know what superbugs are? Okay, 
this time we're discussing Neisseria meningitis, Neisseria meningitis, meningococci, commensal carriers in the nasopharynx. Meaning, some of us would really have Neisseria meningitis in the in our pharynx. Um, it has the capability of crossing the epithelium and goes to our circulatory system. Tanda niyo, Neisseria meningitis. If it's press, if it's already present in the circulatory system, you call it meningococcemia. If a, if this has reached the CNS, then the infection is called meningitis. Okay. It will primarily affect immunocompromised, meaning people with weak immune system. Um, young children and trauma victims. Um, if, if, if it's a trauma victims, um, particularly uh, a trauma victims means you are immunocompromised and at the same time, okay, the trauma or the injury could inadvertently expose blood, CNS, and, uh, and the organisms have or would have the ability to invade the blood-brain barrier system. So, it will lead to septicemia. What do you mean by septicemia? Presence of bacteria in the blood. So, that's why it's called meningococcemia. It will localize in the meninges, causing the inflammation of the brain. So, you call it meningitis. It would have a very high fatality rate, 25%. Even if you treat the patient, 25% fatality rate. Um, the encapsulated strains are strains A, B, C, Y, W, 1, 3, 5. Um, the meningitis, Neisseria meningitis could cause epidemic, epidemic meningococcal meningitis. Why epidemic? It could easily be transmitted. Droplets. That's why if there's an outbreak in the school, it's dangerous. If there's an outbreak in the dormitory, in the hospital, it's actually dangerous. Okay? If you're going to extract blood from a person with meningococcemia, you have to wear a mask. Okay? So it could easily be transmitted. Okay? Um, sometimes it's called CSF fever. It can also isolate the organisms for the cerebrospinal fluid. Spotted fever. You'll see later on why it's called spotted fever. So it could be found in oropharynx, oropharynx, nasopharynx of 3 to 30 percent of normal individuals. The main virulence factor is called lipopolysaccharide. This is responsible for the endotoxin, okay? Endotoxin production of the organisms. So this is the reason why it's called spotted fever, okay? Because of the characteristic spots or hemorrhages okay so transmission is by respiratory droplets it would require close contact and if you do not have protection or vaccine meaning you are susceptible then there's a chance for you to get Neisseria meningitis so what will happen what will you feel at first frontal headache stiff neck then a person would be nauseous and constantly vomit sometimes there would be fever and then virulent meningitis could develop. So, there would be skin petechiae because of the de uh, because of the uh, of the purpura. Purpura means there would be bruising of the skin because one of the complications would be the presence of DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulopathy wherein platelets will be consumed and would result into the formation of thrombos, thrombosis, okay? And then there would be tachycardia. Your heartbeat would be very abnormal. And then your blood pressure would drop. And that could be dangerous. One of the complications is called the waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome. Um, it is actually the hemorrhage of the adrenal glands. So DIC will happen, disseminated intravascular. There would be septic shock, meaning your blood pressure would be very low, and then eventually that could happen. 
Meningococcemia or sepsis may go without meningitis. Meningococcemia or sepsis alone is already dangerous. So, this is an example of a disseminated meningococcal disease. So, diplococci are actually isolated from the epithelial rash. So, the lab diagnosis, um, CSF, blood, or nasopharyngeal swab or aspirate to be collected. So, CSF um, can improve the detection on direct examination. We can grow the organism in cheese blood agar, but preferably in chocolate agar plate, particularly the ones that are specific for Neisseria, the Martin Lewis medium or the modified tire Martin medium. So, as you can see, the organisms are positive for glucose and maltose. So, this would be the gram stain of a specimen coming from the CSF. This one is what you call purulent meningitis. Why purulent? Because the CSF okay, would have many neutrophils. That's why it's called purulent meningitis. And then the organisms, the colonies in in chocolate and in sheep's blood agar plate. Treatment would also be penicillin, but prophylaxis could be could also be given. Um, this is the time wherein the giving of antibiotics without any sense of symptoms would be would would be advisable. Prophylaxis meaning, for example, in a dormitory, you all live in the same dormitory, and then one of the residents got sick with meningococcemia, so usually. Doctors uh, would, give, would be giving prophylaxis to the other residents of that door. Even if you don't show signs and symptoms. Okay, vaccines for some subtype, but they are not very effective, but vaccines could help limit an outbreak. So, who are at risk of getting this? Okay, military recruits, prefer, uh, maybe because they live in a barracks, in barracks close together or asplenic patients or those patients without spleen travelers to epidemic areas so this is a chocolate agar plate showing the colonies of Neisseria meningitis okay so there are also non-pathogenic species of Neisseria normal inhabitants would rarely cause a disease and they would usually be opportunistic infections so group one where Neisseria meningitis and gonorrhea belong, they are primarily pathogens. Group 2 are commensals that can grow on selective media. And the difference between group 2 and group 3 is that group 3 cannot grow on selective media. Okay, so infections reported to be caused by Neisseria species, aside from group 1, are the following. Men meningitis, endocarditis, Prostatic valve infection, bacteremia, pneumonia, and pyremia, bacteriuria, osteomyelitis, ocular infection, and even dog bite. So, what does it mean? There are commensals, but they could become opportunistic, particularly if you have a very weak immune system. So, you may read uh, additional information from your book and particularly for the differential test for Neisseria and related organisms and their appearance under the culture. And here are some of the lists of non-pathogenic Neisseria. And then we we'll move on to another gram-negative proxy. And this now pertains to Moraxella. The most popular species is Moraxella cateralis. Um, it has gone through several name changes. Name changes, but there are basis for name changing. Unlike you guys, when you change your name in Facebook, there is no basis. But here, the DNA um, analysis would be the name basis. Um, first known as Neisseria cataralis, but because it was discovered by Dr. Sarah Branham, so they renamed it as Branhamella cataralis. But because of the DNA homology with Moraxella, they now name it as Moraxella cataralis. Um, these organisms are common commensals of human upper respiratory tract. And there are two 
morphologic form. Some of them are diplococci, that's for the cataralis species. Some of them are rods, that's for the lacunata. Okay? Both of them are oxidase positive, aerobic, and facultative anaerobe. And so quite difficult to culture them because they are susceptible to drying, cold sunlight, and pH changes. And they would also require high CO2 for growth. So, the enzyme beta-lactamase is the main virulence factor being produced by more than 50% of the organisms. This allows the organisms to persist and compete with respiratory tract. Even if the person is undergoing antibiotic therapy, the organisms can compete with them because they produce beta-lactamase. And you know already the action of beta-lactamase. Though they are normal commensal, they could also cause pneumonia, sinusitis, and otitis media. Especially if you are old, immunodeficient, such as decrease in the number of neutrophil. So this is how they look like. So they are also diplococci. Okay, so in, in chocolate agar plate, do you know how to describe the colonies? It is called a um, wagon wheel appearance because it looks like the colonies look like the wheel of a wagon. Wagon wheel appearance. Okay, that's the that's how it looks like. Wagon. You know wagon. Okay. So, moraxella can cause exacerbation of the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease since they infect the upper respiratory tract. They can cause pneumonia and otitis media in children. Otitis media is luga in Tagalog. 